Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us, and thank you, Andy, for hosting. Um, as usual, we'll start with some numbers, and then I will give a brief update and then turn it over to Paul. As of this morning, Northern Light Health is caring for 46 individuals uh, as inpatients without our, within our system uh, who are positive for COVID-19. One of them is at A.R. Gould Hospital, 26 at Eastern Maine Medical Center, three at Inland Hospital, four at Maine Coast Hospital, two at Maine, Maine Mayo Hospital, and 10 at Mercy Hospital. In addition, our home care and hospice team is taking care of six patients who are positive for COVID-19 in their homes. Our two-week positivity rate is 10.35%, with our one-week positivity rate being 10.55%. This indicates that we have continued uh, significant spread of disease throughout our communities, and people should take notice of that. Um, newly released data from the CDC stated that unvaccinated individuals are about six times more likely to test positive for COVID-19 and 11 times more likely to die from the illness compared to people who are vaccinated, though we do know there are slight differences in risks based upon the vaccine type according to this newly released data. In more concrete numbers, that means 737 out of every 100,000 individuals who are not vaccinated will test positive for COVID-19 with 13 of those dying. Versus, and this is in comparison to between 80 and 170 per 100,000 individuals who are vaccinated testing positive and only one to three of them dying. For Maine, that could represent around 7,300 fewer cases of COVID-19 and 143 fewer deaths if everyone was vaccinated. We continue to share our COVID-19 hospitalization graphic with the public that details the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 who are vaccinated and those who are unvaccinated. We are now providing some age data as well. People 65 and over are at increased risk for severe illness for COVID-19, but new variants are affecting people of all ages. Our graphic has been redesigned to reflect the ages for our current inpatients. You may have noticed that the number of vaccinated inpatients has grown over the past couple of months, and the data makes it clear. If you are, or are 65 or over, or you have a health condition that puts you at increased risk, you and your loved ones should take extra steps to stay safe. If you are elig eligible, get your booster and make sure everyone is up to date on their vaccinations. Mask up to stay safe in crowds and continue to wash your hands often. Northern Light Health is prepared to start offering Moderna and Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccination boosters once the ACIP and the CDC give final guidance. We anticipate that this could happen as early as this week or next. We are also preparing to distribute Pfizer vaccinations to children 5 through 12 once authorization is given, most likely early to mid-November. Right now, the FDA and CDC do not recommend COVID-19 booster shots for most people between ages 12 and 65, but for those 65 and over who have received the Pfizer vaccine, they should receive a booster dose, as well as those 50 and over with underlying health conditions. Regarding mixing and matching vaccines, some published reports have indicated this is likely to happen, but at this time it is still not recommended. We will follow the final recommendations of the FDA and the CDC. We eagerly, eagerly await that guidance. The most important thing we can do to stop serious illness from COVID-19 is to ensure that every eligible person completes their initial vaccine series. Also remember that it is time to get vaccinated against influenza. It is safe for you to get your flu shot and a COVID vaccine at the same time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. Uh, so I'm pleased to report Northern Light uh, has surpassed 97% uh, vaccination rate among our staff. Um, so we're pleased with that number and we continue to work with uh, the remaining 3%, um, some of whom have been vaccinated uh, outside of Northern Light Health uh, at other facilities across the state uh, and, and are sharing that information with us uh, as we're discussing with them their, their plans uh, with the state mandate approaching on the 29th. Um, so we know that that number uh, will, will continue to increase um, as we approach the state deadline. Uh, in addition, we do have some employees uh, who have, uh, of that 3% who, are, who remain unvaccinated, um, who've expressed interest in becoming vaccinated. And so we're working with them um, so that they would take some time away from work following the 29th on which uh, they wouldn't be fully vaccinated until the date in which they are. So we're working with them in those uh, issues as well. Certainly our intent is to keep our staff uh, keep them working, uh, keep them compliant with the uh, state mandated vaccine uh, or medical exemptions, uh, and we continue to work with them on that. 
Uh, so that uh, work is ongoing, uh, and we're, we're certainly pleased to achieve uh, and surpass the 97% mark uh, as a milestone, uh, and we continue to work uh, toward 100%. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. Uh, we'll start today with uh, Alyssa, WABI. Alyssa, you should be able to unmute now. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I'll start with this question we got from a viewer. Maybe, Dr. Jarvis, you could take this one. Um, with COVID booster vaccinations, um, somebody wanted to know, can their current antibody levels be measured to determine if a booster is necessary? Yes, that's a great question. And the question is whether we can test for antibodies to determine whether someone needs to receive a booster. The answer to that actually is, is somewhat complex. And that's because right now we do not know the level of antibodies a person needs to have circulating in order to be protected from further infection or, or first infection from COVID-19. And that's been a dilemma that we've had really since the beginning of the pandemic is trying to determine what level is necessary. And because we don't know that, we still recommend booster shots for those that fit in those specific categories, anyone over the age of 65 and those between the ages of 50 and 65 who have underlying conditions. It may be appropriate for people who are 18 to, to age 50 um, if they have underlying medical conditions to talk it over with their providers as to whether they too should uh, get a booster shot. And then of course, those that work in occupations where they're at higher risk for exposure, such as first responders, healthcare workers, grocery workers and the like. So thank you for the question and the opportunity to try to clarify that antibodies is not the way for us to determine whether somebody is immune. Thank you. And I guess my last question, we're seeing um, deaths still, maybe five, six a day. Can you just elaborate what you guys are seeing within the Northern Light System um, as far as that goes? Yeah, so it's hard to, to, to talk about trends when we are talking about small numbers, and we're happy that we are talking about small numbers. But we do continue to see occasional deaths from COVID-19 across our hospitals. Um, and of course, as the state numbers imply, um, death is certainly a, a consequence of, of COVID-19. So you know, the best thing to do is to protect yourself by never getting sick in the first place. The ways to do that, vaccinate, mask, hand washing, appropriate social distancing, and please stay home when you're ill. So thank you for the opportunity to once again say those important messages. Uh, thanks, Alyssa, for your questions. Uh, next up, we have Eric Russell, Portland Press Herald. Eric, you should be able to unmute now. Uh, thank you both. I think this question uh, is for Dr. Jarvis. Um, I want to talk a little bit about preparations for vaccinating kids between 5 and 11. Uh, it could be as early as a couple of weeks before that happens. Um, and I know that preparations are, are happening. What um, are pediatricians in the Northern Light Network expecting in terms of their role in this process? So already most of our pediatric practices and our primary care offices are already delivering Pfizer vaccine to our patients, either as their primary series or for the booster shot for those that, that it's recommended for. And so we already have that as part of our practice and we'll continue that um, once we start talking about being able to vaccinate those between the ages of five and 12. In addition to that, we are also working with the state and our partners uh, in the Department of Education and the School Nurses Association to be able to continue to do vaccine administration at uh, schools as well. Um, that's something that we do year in and year out when it comes to influenza vaccine. And so we are very capable of doing that and have a very good process for working with our partners across the state in order to be able to do that. In addition, we'll be able to do that vaccination through our retail pharmacies. And if necessary, we will set up special clinics if people are unable to access either a primary care provider, a school-based clinic, or one of our pharmacies in order to make sure that we have available and readily uh, be able to administer vaccine to, any, again, anyone who is eligible and desires to be vaccinated. And the follow-up question to that, I think, is the educational piece. I know you're going to have any number of parents who, even if they're feeling comfortable with vaccines for themselves and their adult loved ones, they may have a layer of concern for their kids for whatever reason. Um, what's the messaging going to be <clears throat> to parents who are still a little bit hesitant um, for their kids, especially given, you know, although there are um, serious outcomes for kids, for, for the most part, it has been a relatively mild disease for children, which I think everybody agrees is great. And so what's kind of the messaging along those lines? So, of course, the messaging is going to be twofold. So the first will be reviewing the data that comes to us from the CDC and the FDA rather than from Pfizer themselves. We want to make sure that it has been vetted. 
We will do our own internal process and vetting as we, have, as we did with the uh, vaccine as they became available for adults. Um, and we have a, a team that does that. Our formulary management team will review that data and then we will proceed in a safe and, 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 fa a safe and adequate fashion. Um, we will use that information to educate on the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. As far as whether or not children should be vaccinated, the issue comes down to, you know, not just looking at serious health consequences and death, which both are, children are at risk if they do become uh, uh, infected with COVID-19, just not as great a risk as those uh, who are adults. But kids with, with certain underlying illnesses will also have an increased risk. But we also have to look at the other greater good for the community. Would you put your family at risk like your elderly grandparents or some other person in the house who's immunocompromised if a child were to become ill with COVID-19. And then that child themselves, will they have to be quarantined and removed from school and, and in-person learning? So those are some other things to factor in. And we talk about that with lots of other uh, vaccination products. We don't simply talk about endpoints of death and severe illness. Sometimes we have to talk about some of the other consequences of even becoming mildly uh, um, afflicted with the disease. Good example of that is chickenpox. Most people do very well with chickenpox. Some do have severe disease and unfortunately there are some deaths, but the consequences of having chickenpox are that child can't go to school, similarly with COVID-19. And so you really need to put all of that into place and we will educate our parents and as well as our providers and others about all of those issues uh, once we have the availability of being able to provide those vaccines. So thank you and I, I apologize for the lengthy answer, but it was a deep in, and in-depth question. Very good. Uh, next up, we have Patty White, main public. Patty, you should be able to unmute now. Thanks very much. This question's for Paul. Paul, can you just give us an update on the number of workers who have quit over the vaccine mandate? Sure. So we have 130 employees uh, have left our organization at this point uh, prior to uh, the state's deadline on 1029. So that started back several weeks ago or a few months ago now uh, when the state uh, uh, mandated the flu shot, and then subsequent, um, uh, a few more resigned uh, in the early days with the uh, the vaccine for COVID man uh, mandate. But at this point, 130 is that number. Okay, thanks. And even though your vaccination rate is pretty high, um, are there certain you know departments or facilities where you're going to lose enough people where it could be kind of a, an acute problem? And are you going? Can you tell us how you may address that? Are you going to? Be able to shuffle people from one place to another or what is sure tell us what you're kind of anticipating one of the things that COVID has has demonstrated for us and we've demonstrated through our incident command process is uh with the with infections exposures etc we've had pockets of employees from one group to the next um, in large numbers over the last several months who've been affected and removed from work so we've become very accustomed uh, to shuffling uh, our staff where appropriate uh, where their skill set is appropriate um, to cover for one another. And that can include uh, even some staff uh, uh, working in other locations uh, outside of their normal, uh, normal location. So that work continues to go on now. Um, with 97% vaccinated, uh, certainly there are pockets on a percentage basis where more a higher, higher percent of this department versus that department. Um, but overall, Northern Light uh, has reviewed uh, and continues to review its operational plans um, and we feel confident uh, that we'll have uh, a very limited disruption to any, uh, any of our services. Um, we are working with some of our locations that have a lower vaccination rate than others uh, to provide support from one uh, member organization to the next. So um, we're working on a weekly basis right now, uh, touching base each week with the presidents of each of our hospitals and home care organization to ensure that their particular needs are adjusted um, as we uh, learn more about who's vaccinated, who's not, um, who can we expect to be working after the 29th, uh, and who can we expect not to be here. Um, and so we keep adjusting our plans as those numbers change, as uh, employees make decisions for themselves on whether or not they'll be um, uh, continuing to be a part of the healthcare workforce or not. All right. Uh, thanks, Patty, for your questions. Uh, next up, we have uh, Brian, WAGM. Brian, you should be able to unmute now. How's it going, doctor? Uh, actually, you answered all my questions. Uh, most of my questions were just about mixing and matching. Um, booster shots. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, Terry Stackhouse, WMTW. Terry, you should be able to unmute. Hey, can you hear me? We yes, sure we can. can, Terry. 
Great, thank you. Um, for uh, just curious, for the um, employees who um, are intending to become fully vaccinated uh, but have not yet reached that point, who would be leaving their positions uh, temporarily after the the twenty ninth, would they be paid during that time? Um, what would be the the status of their employment for that portion of time? Sure. So employees. Uh typically have paid time off uh, and we would provide that to them if they if they chose to take their paid time off uh, during the time in which the tw after between the 29th and the time on which they're fully vaccinated so that would certainly be an option for them if they chose um, so that would really be up to the individual employee uh, we also reported on Monday the uh, overall statewide uptick in hospitalizations um, I believe that the number at that time was 51 ICU beds available statewide uh, can you speak to the status of uh, the resources within um, Northern Light um, availability of, of uh, care and beds for the, the most ill patients? So, uh, so the question really is, is around is capacity, um, and, and really that's kind of the number that we have to look at as opposed to fixed beds or things like that. And so capacity is strapped across the state of Maine, um, both for intensive care beds and for general medical surgical beds. Um, this is a, a, a thing that we've been talking about, not just during this pandemic, but certainly historically for the, for the you know, last decade or more, um, we unfortunately just do not have enough hospital beds to care for all individuals. And it's really a twofold problem. One, it's a problem of just having an increased number of, of people who need our services, but then also it's an outflow problem where we don't have enough beds in our skilled facilities and our long-term nursing care facilities um, to take individuals who have recovered from whatever reason that they required um, an acute hospital stay, but are not yet ready to return home. And so we have an issue where we have people who are coming in with an added burden then of COVID-19 um, and then the inability to transfer patients to, a, to an appropriate level of care. But with that, we continue to manage all of our services. And as Paul said, we don't anticipate that we see any uh, curtailing of our services across our Northern Light hospitals. Um, we will continue to do bed management as we always have been. And we will continue to try to put the right patient in the right place for the right level of care at the right time um, in every single case that we can. And so we will continue to manage that on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute, uh, basis and uh, but yes, it is challenging in the state of Maine across our entire um, state for for beds and capacity and being able to care for our, our communities the way we want to. Uh, thanks, Terry, for your questions. Uh, next up is WVII. Uh, David's having some trouble with his mic, so he sent me his question. This one's for you, Dr. Jarvis. He says, uh, "I know the priority is to get people vaccinated and deal with the current virus." But are you worried about other variants like Delta Plus? Yeah, so it's always a concern for people that are in public health, um, and certainly for me in, in my role for Northern Light Health, uh, to worry about what's next um, while we face the challenges that are here in front of us. And so it's not just the next variant for coronavirus, but it's the next other infectious disease agent that comes along that could cause us to have yet another uh, symptom. Uh, and also it's the focus on influenza, which is something that we deal with year in and year out. And so again, it's, it's our, our strong hope that people get vaccinated not only against COVID-19, but influenza this year so that we don't have what people call a twindemic or a, a dual uh, burden for our health systems. Anything that the community can do to make it so that we are able to continue to the services that are needed day in and day out, regardless of any kind of respiratory virus that's circulating, such as taking care of people who, are, who have been in a car accident, people who have had a heart attack, women who need to deliver safely in a hospital setting, um, you know, and children who may be ill who need, to, who need that critical care. We need to be ready and available for them. Vaccination is our best way to prevent those extra people coming to our hospital um, for things that we typically do not deal with, such as high volume of influenza patients or now COVID. Uh, so yeah, I'm always concerned about those, the, the, the next thing and we need to be prepared. And I think if, if there's one thing we should learn from this particular pandemic is that public health and emergency preparedness are critical to the infrastructure of everything we do in America. All right, thanks. Um, next up is uh, Mal, WGME. Mal, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, good. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, the, the courts just ruled, and I, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but the courts just ruled in favor of the vaccine mandate. It included some Northern Light uh, employees who were seeking a religious exemption from the vaccine mandate. Can you speak a little bit about um, how you guys are now looking at this and, and what it means for some uh, employees who were 
seeking exemptions for their sincerely held religious beliefs. Sure, sure. So there actually are two uh, recent court decisions since our last uh, discussion last week. Uh, the first uh, came from the U.S. Supreme Court, which declined to hear arguments um, uh, that were uh, to uh, have a temporary restraining order preventing the state's mandate from going into effect. So the, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to uh, render that decision and, and hear that argument. Um, the U.S. Court of Appeals last night uh, issued a decision. They did hear the argument and issued a decision um, that they uh, did not support uh, the uh, the injunctive relief sought by the plaintiff, which means essentially uh, that they uh, are not uh, going to stop the mandate from going into effect on 1029. Um, so that that's consistent with um, Northern Light has uh, supported the van vaccine mandate. Uh, has supported the state's uh, decision to mandate as they have done, uh, and we've chosen to comply with that. And so uh, we see that as uh, prevailing, and certainly Northern Light has been named as, as one of the defendants in that lawsuit. So uh, that's certainly good news from our point of view. Okay, and then uh, I guess my follow-up is, is obviously because there were some employees of yours that were seeking this religious exemption, uh, you know, they might have, um, not just them, but other people in your system uh, may have been looking to um, a court's decision about this. Um, so it sounds like there might be some time if they are thinking now, okay, if this if this court decision um, doesn't go any further um, or is also upheld by the Supreme Court, um, they might reverse um, course and decide to get vaccinated. So there will be some time for them to still do that. They just might not be able, they might just not be able to work and you're, you're able to work with them on that. That's correct. So between now and the 29th, uh, employees can still become, can choose to become vaccinated. Um, and we will work with them uh, in terms of not having them work to, uh, during that interim time where they're not compliant with the state mandate. Uh, but absolutely, if, if folks change their mind uh, during this time period, uh, we certainly would welcome that. Um, and vaccine is still available. We have uh, ample doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine available, which has a single dose. So that means 14 days after that dose, you'd be compliant with the state mandate. Uh, similarly, uh, Pfizer and Moderna have a two-dose series. All of those uh, options are available for our staff uh, who would like to become vaccinated. Great. Uh, thanks, Miles, for your questions. Uh, moving on, we have uh, Chris, New Center, Maine. Chris, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you, Andy. Um, my first question is for Paul. Uh, Paul, I, you know, we've actually, and we've covered most of uh, the, the, the main points, but I, I noticed that you did mention earlier um, that of the kind of remaining 3%, I know this has been ongoing for a while, you're kind of meeting with the, the, the staff one-on-one -on -one to kind of discuss what their hesitations are. And I, I noticed, I think that you said that some are starting to change their minds about it, that, that remaining 3%. H has there been a common reason from those particular people who have started to change their minds as to why they're now willing to get the vaccine when they weren't previously? I, you know, I, I would like to say that here's the reason, uh, but really it's been an individual decision all along. Um, and so employees who are changing their minds, some of them are changing their mind after the court decisions that we just spoke about. Others are changing their mind after they get factual material or information from their provider or from Dr. Jarvis or any other source um, about vaccine safety. Um, some really have just procrastinated and not, not uh, you know, inform themselves. That's, that's, that's a small group as well. So it really is a, is a combination of factors and it really truly is an individual decision that employees are making. Uh, we've been clear on our position uh, for months now. Uh, the state has been clear um, and we're working with people as they go through their own decision process. But I can't tell you that there's one primary reason. I think it's a myriad of, of, of different concerns, issues, questions, um, all of which we're trying to address. Okay, and, and just a quick follow-up before I ask my second question. How would you characterize this process of, of speaking with employees and um, you know, kind of evaluating those who have changed their mind and are now willing to get the vaccine versus uh, those who remain you know, steadfast in their belief to not get it? Would you characterize it as difficult or easy, somewhere in between? I, you know, I think anytime there are employees who have concerns, those can be difficult conversations. Um, you know, we, we certainly, are, are dealing with that uh, and those communications along with caring for our patients and doing our normal everyday work. Um, so certainly it's, it's, but it's extra work, but that's what we're here to do. We're here to care for our employees. 
uh, meet them where they are in terms of their concerns, questions, um, and be respectful and provide them uh, factual information um, for them to, to base their, uh, their decision on. So it's, it's not easy, uh, but it's what we do and we do well and we'll continue to respect and care for our staff um, regardless of what decision they make. Okay, and then this question is, I guess, basically for, for both of you. Um, and Dr. Jarvis, I know I've asked you this question before, but we, we uh, just wanted to know if there's anything new that's emerged as far as, you know, a common thread of misinformation or disinformation about uh, the vaccine that you see that is uh, um, inhibiting rates of people, whether it's an employee or people in the public uh, choosing to get the shot. No, I think if, if there's one if there's one that, that one concern that I hear most often is just simply about the newness of the vaccine. And it, as we have talked about, you know, the technology that used that were utilized to create the, at least the two messenger RNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, is not new. It's been around for decades. Um, it has been used in other applications before. Um, it was just new, meaning that we we didn't have this virus before. So it was created for this particular virus. Um, but that does not preclude the technology that and the and the, the science behind it that we already knew was an effective tool for providing uh, medical care, and that just continues. And then, of course, now we have overwhelming data with the hundreds of millions of people who have now been vaccinated against COVID-19, utilizing any one of the three vaccines that are currently authorized in the United States. And again, we have seen no long-term effects from those, and even the short-term effects have been mild compared to what we've seen with other vaccines. And so we now have vaccines that have an incredible safety profile, an incredible efficacy profile, and they are clearly the best way that we can, we can defeat this pandemic um, and change the way things are going as we currently see them. It's the way that we can protect ourselves. It's the way that we can protect our loved ones, our community, and ultimately uh, everybody involved. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, uh, next is uh, Leah Russell, Bangor Daily News. Uh, Leah, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you. Um, like Brian, I think all my questions have been answered, but thank you doctors for having this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we made it through our list, so we'll plan to end there for today. Uh, thanks all for attending and helping us get this important information out. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll have a high-quality video file of the briefings today um, in about an hour or so. Uh, if you'd like to have a copy, just let us know in the chat or send us an email. We'll get it over to you as soon as it's ready. Uh, a reminder that the COVID-19 inpatient graphic that Dr. Jarvis mentioned earlier uh, is available in the chat via Dropbox. If you aren't able to grab it before you go, just follow up with us after. We'll get that right over to you. Um, so thanks again for joining us today, and with that, Dr. Jarvis, I'll let you have the final word. Yeah, once again, I just want to say thank you to everybody in the media who helps to get our message out. We do know that there will probably be a lot of information coming out in the next week or two, and we will do our best to convey that information as, as accurately and as uh, quickly and timely as, as possible. Um, thank you again for supporting us and for supporting our workers who day in and day out do remarkable things to take care of everybody that we love. So thank you. Thank you.